Welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out today. And thanks for everyone who's online watching. I hope you can hear us. I'll try to speak loudly. Um, it's nice to see familiar faces and new faces here. I want to thank everyone at AIMA for helping this come to fruition. We started talking about this in, I think, 2018 and made a date in 2019 and got canceled last year. And here we are. So it's wonderful to be here. Um, so Heidi Reynolds of AVA, Samantha Ecker, who introduced me, Cheryl Trainer, who's on the laptop back there, Harrison Halaska, who helped to hang the show, and Nick Gaffney, who's a tech person or helps with tech here. And also, I'd like to thank Everhard Jobek, who's, I think, listening in Germany. Uh, he's a wonderful supporter of my work and has created the first exhibition of most of this work in Europe, the early version of this. And it also included archaeological illustrations, so it was sort of a retrospective show. We traveled around Germany and also to Portugal, so Everhard, thank you. Uh, also to the Mitchell Giddings Fine Arts, my gallery in Brattleboro, Vermont, who opened a version of this show in 2017. Um, and Susan Goldwitz, Goldwitz, who's been really helpful in editing. Thank you very much. And also to Mark, my husband, who's a great support. Julie, Julie, thank you. Um, so, Sam mentioned that I work in Egypt, and the work I do there is very meticulous. Scientific illustration, uh, facsimile drawings of undocumented temple and tomb walls. This work is the other end of my spectrum. Uh, I'm an abstract artist. I, I've learned realistic drawing, painting early on, and then at one point, started to go abstract and never turned back. Um, but someone mentioned to me recently, I said, I haven't done figure drawing in years. And they said, that's what you do in Egypt. So I guess I do. Um, but this, the title of this show, Mapping the Unknown, I was thinking, can you really map the unknown? And the more I, I'm now looking back on it, I asked myself that question. And, this work is more about diverging from the ordinary maps that we know and delving into uh, more emotional and just off course from what a usual map would be. And I'll tell you some of the stories behind some of the work. Um, I, I hope that this work breathes life into our structured maps that we have known and loved. Um, as I was working on some of these, one of these in particular, I heard a piece on the radio about how we are losing our ability to read maps. We're so used to looking at a little tablet, tiny version of where we're going, or listening to it from someone speaking on our tablet. Um, so I grew up in New Hampshire, southern New Hampshire, a little tiny town. Lots of nature, lots of running around wild in the woods, exploring, uh, identifying birds and plants and northern lights and learning really to observe and to notice. And I think that's the essence of what art is. You really look and you notice things. And I think it began there. And both my parents, my mother was, their visual, they were visual people. My mother was a hairdresser. And my father was a two and dye maker. And uh, all of my uh, five kids and all of us either did music and or art. So somehow we got the visual gene. My high school was in Keene, New Hampshire. And it actually had a pretty good art department. And I learned a variety of techniques and uh, mediums there. And the doors were always open. You could skip a class like algebra, for example, and just drop into the 
the art rooms and no one asked any questions. So I really loved it. <laughs> um, I studied painting towards the end in high school. I, I had a, quite a professional portrait painter who I studied painting with. And I learned a lot about color theory and uh, composition. I, after high school, I, I went on, I just took what we called gap years. So I ended up taking three gap years. I had applied to the Rhode School of Design, which was the only place I wanted to go. And I didn't get in. So I took some time off. I worked a bunch of different jobs. I studied painting with this fellow Richard Whitney. Um, and I went to Europe. It was the time of Europe on $5 a day. So it was an eye-opening trip and dream come true. As a little kid, I used to read the Boston Globe and cut out the little uh, ads for get this brochure about traveling in Spain, go to Morocco. And I'd wait for them in the mail and they'd come. And so I always wanted to travel. Um, and during those three gap years, that trip to Europe was really the, the dream come true. Three years later, I got into the Renan School of Design finally. After another eye-opening experience, it was just incredible. Living in a city, uh, quite a lot more diverse than our little town in New Hampshire. And um, I learned a lot. It was a fabulous experience. And during that time, some of my professors were quite inspiring. An anthropologist who was working with tribes in South America, the Yamanabu tribe. And I thought, may, I almost went with him once on a trip to South America, and that didn't work out. But another professor was David McCauley, illustrator who had just been to Egypt. And I saw his slideshow, and I thought, well, what am I going to do when I get out of art school? Maybe I can get a job traveling and making a living. Um, so David McCauley was a great inspiration, and as well as another art historian who had been to Egypt as well. Um, so my interest in Egypt began to get perked. I studied hieroglyphs with an Egyptologist at Brown. She was teaching at the Risley Museum as well, and I, Florence Friedman, and I went to Egypt with her on a tour. And uh, that was, in a way, it was one of the most incredible adventures I had ever had and Egypt was all new and very foreign and now I speak some Arabic and find my way around and it's a very different experience but um, also during that time I was painting uh, large paintings that were of archaeological excavations so I was imagining these gold things and finding things under the earth and um, I moved to Vermont and uh, continued painting I worked at a bunch of different kinds of jobs and ended up being a professor in art at the community college. Got a bunch of different kinds of painting, drawing, landscape painting. Uh, we went to museums. That was maybe once every weekend. I'd give a slide talk on Friday night and we'd go to a museum on Saturday. And these are people who've never gotten out of Brattleboro where I live. So it was really inspiring to watch their enthusiasm grow. Um, during that time, um, I got a job in the Delta of Egypt drawing pot charts with the University of Minnesota. And uh, it was July, very hot, um, in a tiny, tiny village. And that was uh, pretty tedious, but also an immersion into the culture, uh, which was a great experience. After that, I, I decided I would uh, apply to graduate school and was going to go just about to move to New York to graduate school. And I got a call from the University of Chicago. I had been applying to all these archeological excavations for years. The University of Chicago asked me, do you still want this job? And I said, I have to think about it overnight. And, uh, I ended up taking the job and that was 36 years ago. Um, I never regretted that decision. Um, in, so the, the project is 100 years old. It's through the University of Chicago and we, it's fondly known as Chicago House. So if I talk about Chicago House, that's my work in Egypt. Um, 
So as I was mentioning, I, as a fine artist, I was very interested in archaeology. But then to work as an archaeological artist was, it gave me the opportunity to be in Egypt and experience this culture and to also be making a living in a very interesting field. Um, we're documenting, as I said, tombs and temples that haven't been documented, publishing through the University of Chicago very meticulous work. All of our work is online now, so you can find it through the University of Chicago's website. Um, the living situation there, I, I, I have a series of rooms facing the Nile, very beautiful. Um, there's about 18 of us who live together. We're working at two or three different sites and uh, we all have our meals together. We head across the Nile, we go to our site, and in the evenings, I work on my fine art. So I have another studio for my fine art. And uh, one of the, the pieces, well, I'll, I'll begin to tell you about the work. Um, while I was in Egypt, I visited a, uh, an antique shop that I know and love and found these rolls of their topographical maps of the area that I used to. That I worked in, I'm working still, and used to walk around a lot when I first went to Egypt and worked in Luxor. And so some of these topographical maps are in the collages behind you. I'll talk about those in a bit. Um, so painting, I had been doing oil painting for about 40 years. I was getting a little uninspired by it, and a friend, my friend Muriel here, said, Well, let's do some print making. And I said, okay. And we had, I, I thought, I don't have time for this. Whatever. But we did, she assured, assured me that we would have fun. And we did have fun. And I got back into printmaking. And I've been continuing to printmake ever since. And I think the reason why is that it's such a challenge that printmaking is reversed. Whatever you put, monotypes are a single print that comes it's one print, it's not multiples, but you can send it through the one piece. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just see what, where the piece leads me. So in a way, it is like mapping. It is like following a path, an internal path to get to a final place where you think, okay, now I've arrived. And this series, so the Red Sea series, I created at the Vermont Studio Center up in Johnson, Vermont. It was a week, I was a uh, Vermont artist week, and it's just a week, immersion, you're working all day, you're being fed wonderful, delicious food, and with friends, and uh, I had my own press. It was deluxe. Um, and I started with very simple colors, just a few reds, a few browns, and I've continued with these later ones here different colors, um, different methods, but I'm still very interested. And the titles of some of these works like Red Sea, I didn't know I was, when I started painting, printing, I didn't know I was going to make something called Red Sea. It just turned into, it made sense that the two halves, the red, the very botanical, some of them are quite, uh, almost like things are flowing in water. And so I, Titled it this. And behind me is the first of a series called Map of Water. And again, I started and turned into five pieces. Um, I didn't title it Map of Water, but as I was working on it, I realized I heard something on the radio about how 
in our lifetime, UNESCO said we will perhaps see more plastic in water than fish. Things like that are just what can you do? That? How do you digest that kind of information? Um, and I wondered, would we someday need a map of water, not a, um, a diagram of what the water is, but capturing the very essence of it? I think of the core samples that they've taken of icebergs and ice and the polar poles. And the water that they find there is different. It has different ingredients. It has different bacteria than the water today. So it's, it's become a fascinating thing for me. Um, some of the, the objects that I use for the printmaking, so I, I start with a plate, I roll ink on the plate, and then I can paint it like a painting. I can put down objects. This second one here, I put plastic. Uh, this one here has plastic that uh, acts as a resist. So, and I run them through the press to get deeper colors. Um, I've used other things like I was trimming my garden with the tiny lily fronds and found a pile of these beautiful pieces of dry tiny lily fronds. And they were, I thought, I can use these in print -making. And I find these on the street. I found um, something in this one. I can't identify it immediately, but it's a plastic bag, a netted plastic bag that I found in Egypt on the street. Um, anything, and some of it, I've used uh, the cambium layer of trees, which is like the, the last large piece at the end, is um, I peeled that off the side of the tree. It's like a, a, an artery system for the tree. And these two, these are diptychs. So they are in two pieces. I'll begin, this is the one with the cambium layer. I'll begin on one half and then begin to look at the composition and say, okay, what's the second half going to be? So that's that challenge I was talking about. Next in this series, I was at the ocean and picked up pieces of seaweed, which is in this one, these two here. So you can print, put a color on the seaweed, uh, run it through the press, and you can make a resist of where the seaweed was, which is this. This is another piece of the, the cambium layer of the tree, a root actually, and as I finished this, I thought it almost seems like lungs. It's, and again, water and breath and lungs, and it just, it became more of the map of water. So then that series is, it may continue. I kind of dip into these series as I feel like I'm inspired to, but uh, this is another series called between breath and the river. And again, they got, they got titled at the very end. I was in a, a class at the River Gallery talking about my work. Some people said, wow, it's like a breath. It's like what happens when you breathe in and exhale. And then some people said, no, it's the river. It's the movement of the flow of a river. And so the title is Between Breath and the River. Um, for these, I also am thinking about how rivers, a riverbed will change over years and how oxbows are created and glacial, the original shape of the river during glacial times is so much larger than what it ends up to be. It could be that this is what it was originally, but then the small trickle of water at the bottom. Um, lots of ideas just are always flooding through. 
and they are gaps for it, I think. Um, but others, I mentioned being at the Chicago House Library and finding, I, I didn't know where I was going to begin with my artwork. And so I went to the library and I remember sitting on the floor looking at an old uh, early documentation by the French of the Levant, North Africa and into Asia. And I found a map that was from the 1100s, which is this map here called Travels with Idrisi. And I looked at it for days. I started copying over it, tracing it. I could not understand what this map was. It was purely abstract to me until I realized that during medieval times, north is at the bottom and south is at the top. So it started to make sense. Um, I had the opportunity to make this. To, it's my version of the map. Um, and in Bonn, where the show opened up at a museum, at the university, there was a large wall, and I thought, hmm, I could make I could make a copy of this map. So I found paper, these uh, handmade Indian papers, and began. Uh, so I'll describe a bit about what it is. The Mediterranean, the water is this color, the ochre color. And this map was considered accurate for 300 years, but it shows only water masses, land, and villages. I also wondered, as I was working on it, I kind of copied his patterns in the water. And for example, the Mediterranean has three or four diagonals in this, this body of water. And I wondered, is that water currents? Was he also documenting water currents? I don't know. Um, so this is the Nile Delta, the Nile going up into the Sudan, the blue and the white Nile it's coming across. This is Mecca, Cairo, um, just before the Nile turns into the Delta, the Red Sea, the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, and over to where the Tigris and Euphrates. This is where the marsh Arabs lived, which I had read about. And I, so in a way, I traveled there as I was, I was making, I was just diving into this, this map. And it was a wonderful opportunity to create something. This is the largest piece I've ever made, so it was a thrill to dive in. Um, along with the use are something, this collage series, which are titled Gurna Travels, which Gurna is the village where I work in Egypt. It's on the west bank of the Nile. And um, I found a, a rolls of tattered 1907 topographical maps of Gurna. And I bargained for them in, in my favorite little antique shop. And he said, oh, you know, I, I got to get 200 pounds. He says, no, no, no. And I came back the next year, and there was even more tattered in the corner. And he said, you can have them all for 200 pounds. So it's not much in dollars. So I took them all, not knowing what I was going to do with them. But that this area, actually, this, this uh, name is the temple where I work, Medina Tabu Temple. Um, it's an area where when I first started working in Luxor, I spent a lot of time walking around the hills of Gurna, the desert. If you walk west, uh, east enough, you can step one foot on green and still have a foot in the desert. And that's the desert that stre stretches all the way across Africa. Um, it's a really magical place. There are pigments in the stones, ochre pigments. And I felt that these were recreating my memories of that time, that kind of first, the first years in Egypt and uh, what it felt like to be in such a magical place. So this series, and there's two over on that side. Um, I also want to tell you about 
this book as another a collaboration, which um, Mark and I were walking along the street in Brattleboro, and we came across a, a woman in a little chair, a little table with black old typewriter and a sign that said, Palms to order. So we nudged each other and said, okay, we've been reading a book called Words to Live By. So we said, how about a poem called Words to Live By? Went for a cup of tea, we came back. And Jenna Rose Nethercott, the poet, has created this beautiful little poem on a scrap of paper. And it was about traveling and you don't want to drink down all of the Atlantic because there's much, much too many ghosts and it, it wouldn't be comfortable for you. And it also talked about lovers being split by the ocean across continents. And I didn't know her. She didn't know that I worked in the She didn't know that my husband and I are part for each winter for part of the year. It just captured so much. Um, I was telling Eberhard, my friend in Germany, and he said, we have to do a book. I thought, okay. <laughs> and I invited Jenna Rose over, and we we immediately connected. We were talking about, I told her about the ghosts in printmaking where you run it through the press, you peel off your paper, and you can run that through the press again and create what they call a ghost from maybe it's plastic or maybe it's my tiger lilies of the canyon layer. But those are all they create ghosts. And Jenna Rose and I were talking about ghosts and water. And I sent her home with uh, most of these on this wall, map of water, the Red Sea, the Dree Sea, and the uh, Gerda Travels. And actually some of these, so all this work is in the book. Um, a year later, she came up with the poems, and I, I knew she was a narrative writer, but I didn't know how she was going to look at my work. And it's, we created this book. It's um, quite, there's this piece on the wall over there. So it's the poem and the piece. And it was just a really meaningful collaboration between the two of us. And she will be reading here on Saturday. So um, come back. Um, I wanted to round up by talking about, again, the idea of mapping and mapping the unknown. And how, as I was writing about this show, I realized the way I paint is I, I begin, I hope to lose myself in the work. The idea. I might start with an idea, but it ends up quite different. But and to delve, lose my busy world, delve into a place of not knowing. So I guess that's what I'm asking the viewer to do: to stand in front of a piece and look, really see, like you would with nature, or with or listening to music, that lose yourself and find yourself. So both the artists, I do it in the studio, and that's what this work is, it's an invitation to, to lose yourself or find, find yourself again. So thank you very much. And thank you all out there in the ethers for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all. Bye. Right. Any questions or thoughts or ideas or anything for me? I got something from uh, the internet. Sappy <laughs> said hi from Jordan. Oh, great. <laughs> great. Hi, Sappy. And Nabila and Hiba. <laughs> Is that it? No question? No. I wonder if you'd be willing to choose one of the poems, even though Jenna Rose would be here Saturday. Oh, sure. Because not all of you will, will be here for the poem that goes with one of the pictures. I'll, I'll read this one about the map of the Dreesy behind me. Here it is.
Jenna, if you're listening, I hope I can do this justice. The cartographer. I've spent all night sitting awake in the yellow lamp light, parchment splayed open, brush tip falling into pools of cherry ink. I document familiar landmarks, the cave mouth of an old granite quarry, the first, second, and third highway exits, the tar pit where a man lost his heartbeat from a ground recluse fight as he searched the gully for tin cans. I include the overgrown train trestle. There are no trains run any, though no trains run anymore. I include the steeple that the lightning hit and the dried up levee. Because I record these places on the map, they are remembered. There are also places I do not record. Because I do not record them on the map, they are forgotten. Because they are forgotten, they never existed. I do not include the bandstand that vanished under the river before I was born. I do not include the farmland by the rotary. I do not include the trail of bleeding mulberry along the path to your door. I do not include your name. So what Jenna Rose did was she started, she created a narrative of these pieces in order that I, I put them in the book. And it becomes about water, about abundance, overabundance of water, flooding or, map or lack of water, um, people turning on their taps and having dust come out. And so she, and ghosts, Roiling, rolling across the landscape, often in these dried up fields. Um, so she creates that whole image of what is water and what is it to us? How does it, what is it, how valuable it is? And what would we do if we didn't have it? What is, is the book for sale? It's for sale. Um, they're $30 and they're for sale here. Yes, uh, and your piece here, the paint is so matte that it almost looks like you used earth oxides. But what did you use for the paint? What did you so the question is, the paint looks so matte, it's almost like I used earth oxides, or as if it was pigment rubbed into the paper. And it does look like that. I think it's the, the Indian paper absorbed. I use gouache paint, which, which is a opaque watercolor paint. And I tried a number of different colors. I, I had an image in mind that it needed to be these colors. So I tested, it is an oxide paint, I think, um, like a sienna or something like that. Yeah. On your um, River Meander, I'm a river guy, so I love rivers. Um, do, you, do you start with any visual image or aerial photo or, or map or, or an actual map just to, to get you oriented or are those just purely off the top of your head? Um, well, those came out of another, I had a residency in Florence, Massachusetts at CMA's printmaking. And I, again, I landed there and I had no idea what I was going to do. And I pulled out the drawer and the desk. There was a map of the polio the valley they call it there. Mm -hmm. And so the further Connecticut runs through. And I really got involved in the Connecticut and did reading and did um, again that idea of the glacier went through there. We heard a geologist speak at the top of one of the mountains, Mount Holyoke there. And the geologist said, There are no stones in that bottom land. It's perfect for farming. And they all got moved down to Long Island. So thinking of that, so I went from that experience to then working on these. I didn't have any maps, I didn't have any pictures, but I had that feeling, that image in mind of how rivers move and how they uh, really change course can. So they, do, they do look like some rivers that I've seen. Yeah. So they're made with, um, Yarn. Interesting. And the, the yarn, I put it down on the, the, the plate and it flows. It's just, you know, so it, it creates a very liquid 
kind of look, and I look for that too. So, yeah, that's that's a compliment. I know that you spend a lot of time in there. So, anyone else have any thoughts or questions? I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, since you look out on the Nile, do you have a water story from your work time? Oh, it bubbles up to the top of your head. Um, Aside from, you know, trying to go across on the ferry and almost drowning. <laughs> um, someone asked me at my other show at Vision Guineas about the Nile and uh, how people use it there. And people do swim in it, but not much. Uh, there are official boats like ferries and small boats that can be across, but and fishermen, fishermen uh, go out in these tiny skiffs, but people don't, they don't have leisure boats really. And it's, it's known to have very strong and unpredictable currents. And so my story is uh, a couple of people, the son of friends of mine who knew how to swim, um, was at the Nile with some friends of his and he didn't come back up out of the water. It was daytime in the summer. Um, so it's kind of a mysterious body of water. JJ, who was an Egyptologist, and we met in Luxor. Um, what do you have to say about the Nile? Oh, it's scary. Yeah, I was going to say scary. that, but I didn't want to. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, no, it's a, it is, as you say, it has this very strong current that you really you can't see when you're on a boat. It doesn't, you're just kind of sailing along and it's lovely and beautiful, but it's, if you put your hand in it, you can suddenly realize the pull of it, the strength of that Nile River flowing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. And it, it's a little scary at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And also talking about rivers and water, um, they're building a dam in, I believe it's Ethiopia. And Nile runs through 11 countries and they're all, it's, everyone's up in arms because they want to open the dam this summer, I think. And Egypt is saying, please open it slowly, take maybe 12 months because they're, all of their crops are um, irrigated by the Nile. And so it's a question as to whether Egypt will be running out of water. So. Is that a good story? <laughs> <laughs> salt. I just remember salt. I have swum in the many, many, many years ago in, uh, in the far south. Of the day. Salt. It's salty. Yeah. yeah. But it also washes away the salts. And yeah, that's what I was remembering. Yeah. yeah. In ancient Egypt, uh, they talk about the, the floods and the, 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 how it brought life to the land and then it would recede and you could plant your crops and move and live in that area and then you'd move back out of it as it flooded again. And wasn't that the problem that it was that salt was starting to leach out because it was no longer washed away? Um, yes, that is a problem. It used to wash away and even from the monuments it would some of the monuments the now would flood up into the, the monument, wash the ground salts away and then things would dry out. Now the, actually, the reason why we're documenting is that the ground is, the water table stays the same. It's pretty high up because of the dam. And I equate it to the monuments are sandstone, they act like a wick, and they, you can see 15 or so feet up where the moisture is in the stone. So it, that, it is an issue. Yes, about this piece. Is that that's a mono? This is a mono. Okay, so, so can we just explain? I'm just curious. I mean, it looks like black. Mm -hmm. Did you paint that um, after? Um, <laughs> well, this print has drawing. So here, and I was actually thinking of some of the early blueprints that. Chicago House created a So I drew in this area, so that's drawn on. 
This, and I'm using a plastic plexiglass plate with that size. And I paint on, I actually like painting painting. Um, it has threads, it has finger marks. Um, this was painted on afterwards. And Jenna Rose talks about it, I think in one of the poems, of whether it is a, a, a large whale going overhead, are you looking up in the water, or are you looking down at something sunken? So it, it can, it depends. And I, the thing I like about abstract, working abstractly is I get very different responses from people. And that the same painting, I've gotten someone say, I, this work frightens me. And someone else said, it reminds me of my childhood in Venezuela when we used to play with tops and spin them, let them go. So abstract allows you to go wherever you want to travel to. Yes. Uh, although you're working on Egypt uh, with the project is in here. Can you just mention a little bit what it's like to work with like what like what a day at the okay. temple is? Like? What's a day at the temple like? Um, I work in two sites. I work at the Medina Tahu Temple. It's a huge temple from the time of Francis III, which has a number of different layers of history there. Um, and I also work at a small tomb. Um, wake up, I order my breakfast from our cooks. We all get in the van, we drop, no, we don't get in the van anymore. We walk down to the Nile and just walk to the Nile, take a boat, small boat across to the other side. And then a van picks us up there and we start working about, we leave at 7.30, we start work at eight. I'm on a ladder or I'm brawling in the dirt, depends where I am on the, the wall. I'm drawing on a photograph. Originally we drew on photographs, now we're doing it digitally. So I'm on an iPad uh, and I have a photograph as a layer and I'm drawing what I see on the wall. So copying uh, carved line, paint, damage that's historical, block line, architectural block lines, any of that information is all included included in our drawings. And so I'm penciling, doing the penciling as it were. 9.30, we have a tea break, and it's also second breakfast. So all of our workmen, we have about 40 workmen. Uh, most of them speak only Arabic. So my, my Arabic is uh, rather colloquial. But anyway, second breakfast is always great. Sit down and have a little meal of beans and salad and cheese and tea, and then back to work half an hour later. Um, you can either choose, so it's a seven, it's a 40 hour work week, and you can choose to stay at the temple, or you can go back to the house and work in your studio at the house. Um, I'm working with Egyptologists, and also with photographers, and we are working together. That's the method that was devised by our founder, James Henry Breslin, who realized that the monuments had to be documented, but you couldn't just have one person doing it. So the photographer shoots the photograph, the artist draws on the photograph, Egyptologist checks that drawing at the wall, and there's a whole series of back and forth to make it an actor, as accurate as we possibly can. That's our, and the day, so the day ends at about Four, four o'clock, tea time. Um, there's also tea if you're at the house during the daytime, there's tea at 9.30 and cake, and then tea and cake at five, and then dinner at 6.30, and then that's it. That's the day it should come out. Sometimes we have guests, we're kind of like an oasis in Luxor, uh, like JJ is working on a different project, and they'll come for lunch on Fridays and use the library, that's part of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Lunch in Chicago has yeah. Yeah. 
Can you do any of this work while you're in Egypt? Yes, I have a studio there, and these collages were done in Egypt. The, of the old maps, the maps were found in Egypt, and they were done here. We should have the house open again. Inshallah. Um, so will Chicago House open again? We're we're just submitting to the university. We didn't go this past year. We were all working remotely, uh, fortunately. And our director, Ray Johnson, who's listening, hi Ray, uh, has just submitted to the University of Chicago request to return to us. So we haven't been able to, the university has not let us travel. So they're the ones who have not So we'll see. I have some questions from the internet. Yes. Um, someone asked, when did you do the prints at the uh, Vermont Studio Center for Vermont University? When? Yeah. Uh, I think it was 2009. She was introduced to your book, A Ghost of Water, by uh, Joseph Salerno. Yes, yes. She said she was going to listen. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have another. How does your painting inform your printmaking and your printmaking inform your painting? So how does my painting inform my printmaking and my printmaking inform my painting? So modern type prints are actually painting. So I'm still painting on the plate. Uh, it's, it's a different surface. It's paper, not canvas or panel. So it accepts the paint differently. It comes out. The painting is what you're looking at. It's the, the print comes out as a negative of what you plan. So that's a quite different. Um, so I'm saying painting is essentially printmaking, but printmaking, I haven't painted a lot recently and we'll see how it affects my, my painting. Um, I like what happens with print, prints in that you can create many layers and kind of atmospheres, and you have to really work for that in an oil painting. But I would love to be able to get the kind of uh, textures that I get in the prints on, on oil painting. So we'll see. And also size-wise, is whatever I can fit through the press. This is a, I pushed it for that. It's a large size. Painting, I painted quite large, six feet by seven feet, foot maybe. So that's another thing. You're restricted to the size of the press that you have available to you. Can you tell us a little bit about the portrait of the woman's mind? It's not here, but would you wrap it up? The second large map of water was. Um, it's six sheets. And again, I started, I didn't, even it was after I started this one, I had finished this. It was the second of the map of water. I started with a few blue pages and put them at three. I put them down on the floor and I, I wondered, where am I going to go with this? How am I going to, where is this leading me? And I realized it was life science that I could. Well, one of my colleagues passed away in the Nile, and this was my way of honoring her, and in a way, dealing with that experience that was. Very Actually, put, I, it, it, this is the one piece that is a, um, it's an etching. So I, I etched the body, a body, onto this, and I put her into this. And I, I wanted it to be almost mythological, like maybe in in ancient Egypt. The walls, you can find stars on the ceiling and earth and rivers on the wall. They had the whole universe in one wall. And 
I put this twinkle, it's all deep blue. It's twinkling stars at the top and this floating figure. And it's, I'm not sure what to say about it actually. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, but it, it is a very meaningful piece to me. It's very good. Yeah. Cheryl. How do you get these gorgeous blues? Are you layering them? I'm layering. How do I get the gorgeous blues? That's her question. Um, I'm layering them. And also, I'm not sure, but I used oil uh, on some of the earlier prints. I use oil printmaking ink. And I think that that affects the paper differently than water based printmaking ink. These I use oil, actual oil paints that are water based. So I think it's printing and printing, running through the press numbers of times, and until I get the color as rich as I, I want it to be. You combine different blues. Yes. Yeah. That. I, I just keep staring at it. It's like I could just die. Are you talking about this one? Yes. Yeah. This one, it's interesting. I started with this green color. The whole, this whole side was a green color. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? This is an awful green color. <laughs> but I printed the blue over it. And the blue then gets a tinge of green in it. But it kind of tamed that green. And I left the lighter color to kind of play off each other there. So this was an instance where it's in two halves. I started with this half, and that's with the plastic. It's a it's a tarp that's unwoven, so plastic tarp, and it doesn't flow like the, the thread did. It, mm -hmm. it to me it looks like plastic. I have like a lot of tarps as a thread. didn't know they could be used as art. Did you? <laughs> Um, and so the second half, I wanted to balance that. Uh, what I felt was brush color and that what looked like plastic to me. And in a way, thinking about plastic and water, it is appropriate. Um, yeah, to find that depth, it took a number of running it through the press, more blue, wiping it away in this area to keep that green. It can really rework. The, the plate as you're before you run it through with the paper on it. Any other questions? Any thoughts? Um, Elizabeth. Now we have a name. Oh, yes, Elizabeth. She Hi. says, Bravo. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and that she is. This is someone who is an archaeological illustrator as well as an artist. So, kindred spirit. I only know a few of them. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, it's a little awkward. I'm holding it. 